Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as you know, you're here to see Elliot Eisenberg. I'll give a little intro. Elliot Eisenberg, PhD, is an internationally acclaimed economist and public speaker specializing in making econo or economics fun, relevant, and educational. Dr. Eisenberg earned a BA in economics with first class honors from McGill University in Montreal, as well as master and PhD in public administration from Syracuse University. Eisenberg is the chief economist for Graphs and Laughs, LLC, an economic consulting or consultancy that serves a variety of clients across the United States. He writes a syndicated column and authors a daily 70 word commentary on the economy that is avail available at www.econ70.com. Take it away, Elliot. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Thank you for, you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, although I must admit that I I'm going to have, I'm, I'm enjoying being invited here to speak um, more better than the data I'm going to share with you. I'm really sorry. But there are some serious silver linings, and this is very important. So the, the economy is just horrible. And Q3, Q1 data just came out. It was awful. It was negative 4.8. Q2 that we're in right now, almost midway through, or at least a third of the way through, is going to be much worse. But this is sort of the bottom of the bottom. It's like, imagine you're, in, you're, 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 making, you're digging a hole for yourself. We're on the verge of giving away the shovel. Someone's taking the shovel out of our hands. And we're not going to make the ditch any deeper, much longer. We're at the end, we're at the edge of the bottom. We're beginning to hit some bedrock here. So I want you to keep this in mind, and I'll repeat this, this message as we go through the slides. Don't worry about it. And the data just came out this morning. There's some pretty good data and some pretty horrible data, but we're gonna get used to that. But in a month or two, things really begin to turn around. That's the important part. Let's begin by seeing where we were. And GDP, my favorite equation, you all had a class in high school or college you don't remember anymore, and they brought up this terrible equation. It's C, household consumption, I, corporate investment, G, government spending, and X, net exports, X minus M, exports, imports, mass exports, and so on. Going into this recession, or going into this depression, arguably, we can argue about definitions. There's no official definition of a depression, so it's sort of up to us to decide what it is. But in my mind, you have GDP growth of negative 7.5 or 10% in a quarter. That qualifies as a depression. But nonetheless, going into this period of time, I, G, and X minus M were going absolutely nowhere. There was, there was nothing there. Our economy was purely household consumption based. And now, because we're locked in our homes, we're not growing very much. As a matter of fact, we're shrinking really fast. And this will end. This is an abnormally bizarre recession or depression. Normally it comes on slowly, it lasts nine months, 12 months, this last one was 18 months, but that was rare, that was a very long one. Because things just run out of gas, things go wrong in the economy. And it takes a long time for those things to become evident, become evident, while things are good, there's a bubble going, then there are problems, we hang around the bottom and then we begin to improve. This one was great through Jan, Feb, first half of March, and then that. Totally different situation, completely different. And as a result, the recovery can be pretty strong and pretty robust along with government intervention that's helping us. So let's see what's going on here. First, this is expectations for Q2, what we're in right now. And you can see they range anywhere from negative nine to negative 40. This is already a week old data, so the times change pretty fast. But I'm gonna guess if we had to tell, if I had to tell you and you know, put my daughter up as collateral, I'd have to say negative 30%. So we had negative 4.8, we're gonna have something five or six times worse now because we're closed the whole month, it's much more serious, you know, everybody's closed and so on and so forth. But again, that's the end of the story. We get all that out this quarter. We're really done with bad news after that. The question is how good the news becomes. That's a no. We can talk about the shape of the recovery, we'll talk a lot about that too. Let's begin by looking at this consensus of what economists are forecasting or what economists think is likely to happen. Right? And you can see here Q1 minus three, four, five percent. That's what came to pass. Forecasts weren't all that bad. Pretty good. Q2 negative 25. I tend to think it'll be minus 30, but we're in the right ballpark, certainly. But you can see here Q3 and Q4 on the far right, those two bars on the far right look better. They're not spectacular. This is not a V-shaped recovery where the down is 25 percent and the up is 25 percent. No, the down is 25 and 30 and the up is six. This is not a V, right? Just take the V and just get it out of your head. Just knock it out. It's not going to happen. The 
There's no V in our future. This TV show is not brought to you by the letter of V, if you think of Sesame Street. <clears throat> so what we're going to get better, Q3 and Q4 are going to be better for I think Q3 is, you know, maybe 4520, somewhere around negative 2. But Q4 could be positive 8 or 9, I think. So I think in total, what the economists are saying here is right. But I think Q3 is not as good and Q4 is better. But then we go to 21, and we're going back to 2 or 3% growth. So I think it's more like a check mark recovery. Very steep decline, slow, steady, improvement out. How fast do we get out of this? Mm, I think by mid-22, that's a ways away. I know we're now in mid-20, so we're two years away, two and a half years away. It'll take us to recover the loss we experienced in this year. This year will be a bad year. We'll end up being negative five or negative six GDP growth. Next year will be negative, we'll be positive three, and then the next year is positive three, and then we're kind of out by the end of 22. It's going to take a while, and it'll take probably an extra year for employment growth to get back to where it was because firms are going to learn to do better with fewer people, and they're not going to hire so many back. That's what we experienced in 08, and that's going to happen again. Now, consumer sentiment is horrible. There's no question about it. You ask people, how do you feel right now? And they feel really, really bad. They don't have a job. They're afraid they're going to die when they buy groceries. These are really problems. When you, when you have to balance shopping and death, shopping loses out generally. And that's the problem we face. We're nervous. There's no treatment. There's no cure. There's no, there's no vaccine. So we're feeling awful. But again, look at the rate of decline. Look how precipitous the fall has been here. If you look at the far left on the graph where my cursor is, you can see the decline in 2007 8 took two years to happen. Now it took one month, maybe two months. We're going at 12 times as fast. We're accomplishing in a year. It took a month. We're accomplishing a month now. It took a year in the past. So we're going to hit bottom much more quickly than we did in the past. And that means we can begin to recover quickly from a much deeper hole, mind you. But the recovery begins relatively soon. And you can already see sentiment changing in data like this slide. On the top slide, you can see it's consumer sentiment. Is it horrible? Yeah, it's horrible. But has it bottomed out? Probably. And the bottom slide asks, are things getting better in green? And the answer is, no, they're starting. And are things getting worse in red? And they're getting a little better now. Look, nothing's good. Don't get me wrong. Nothing's great here. I'm not happy. I'm not jumping out of, out of bed. I'm not shooting confetti in the air. But my point is, the worst is probably just about over, whether it ends up being middle of May or end of May, we've been through six weeks of probably the 10 that we have to go through to get to the end. That's the important part, right? So I don't want you to take what you're experiencing now and extrapolate into the future. If you do that, you do it at your own risk and it's completely inappropriate. We're gonna hit the bottom and we're gonna be done and we're gonna slowly get out. Again, we can argue how fast, how much, how good the recovery is, but we're no longer gonna be declining much more. I'm gonna show you more data on this point. I, mean, I, am, I am beyond confident of this. There's no doubt in my mind at all. I have doubts about the recovery, but not about when we hit bottom, which will be relatively soon. Here's hotels, hotel occupancy rates. You can see the hockey stick shape here, right? It's, we're almost at the bottom. So this is, I mean, it's terrible that it's fallen so much. It's a calamity that it's fallen so much, but we're almost at the bottom. Next comes, uh, next piece of data I look at here is a uh, 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 restaurant. Okay, it can't get below zero. It's going to start to improve. And it's actually better than this, of course, because takeout is doing a land office business. We're going to all kinds of restaurants and, and going out for food, uh, ordering food in, either with Grubhub or, or, or Uber Eats, or we're going to pick up, take out, and bring it home. That's what I do generally. It's helping local restaurants and so on that I like. So this is, they're getting, what, 20 30% of revenue. It's not great. They can't survive on this, but they'll keep their skeleton staff. They'll ramp up when things get better, and they'll, they'll start hiring people. We all are desperate to go out to eat and have a bottle of wine and meal at a restaurant. I'm telling you, I am desperate. Every day I dream of that and going to a hard rock rock concert. Okay, i got to get rid of this for a moment. Look at the next graph, U.S. air travel. You can see here, it's ridiculously low. It's the levels of, as I coined out on top of the graph, 1954. This is quite remarkable, but look at it. It's bottomed out. There's no question we bottomed out. Whether we bottomed out in May 12th or May 19th, and April 12th or April 19th, I'm not 100% sure, but there's a mild uptick here. People are habituating to the situation saying, what the hell is it? I gotta go somewhere. I'm gonna go. 
I don't really want to go. I'm not eager to go, but business calls, I can't delay any further. I'm going to go. So you can see improvement there. And you can see here, this is, this is, this is like a restaurant booth at Edmonds. This is movie theaters. We're not going to movie theaters, but instead we're buying stuff and watching stuff on Netflix and Hulu and, and uh, Peacock and Disney and all the other 12 million streaming channels I subscribe to for the cost of 200 bucks a month. I'm joking, but you get my point. Now, Let's get a little more serious. The bottom has been hit pretty much. Let's look at air, automobiles. Automobiles are really important. And automobiles are important because they're the closest thing you buy that's a house. It isn't a house. It's a tenth as much as cost as a house, but we make 10 times as many autos per year as we have car households. houses. We build 1.4, 1.5 million homes a year. We sell roughly 15, 20 million cars a year. House costs 400,000. Now a car costs 40,000. So there's real symmetry here. And if we're not buying big, big ticket items and cars, we're probably not buying houses. And you can see in this graph um, that I put up here, you can see we're not buying cars. Interestingly enough, automobile sales fell by about 30%, 33%. They fell by 15% for the first two weeks of March. And they fell by about 45% in the second two weeks of March. It goes to lockdown. You put it together, divide by two, you get it. So auto sales really decline, and in April they're going to decline more because the whole month we're locked in our houses. So the 30 percent, the 15, the 30 percent decline becomes more like a 50 to 60 percent decline. Right? We go from 17 million units to about 7 million units, which is the very bottom of my graph, the very far right hand corner bottom. That's probably where we end up for one month. But, but, and this is important. Look at the next graph I'm putting up. It's automobile sales through April 19th. Look, is it good news? No, no. I, I don't want to confuse you and say I'm happy. I'm not. This is a terrible quarter. This is the worst quarter in memory. This, this is a quarter that rivals the Great Depression, maybe worse than any single quarter during the Great Depression. I'm not sure I've got to look up data on that. But what you see in this graph is auto sales bottom out in early April. And then they begin to get a little better on the week of April 12th and a little bit better on the week of April 19th. Are they good? No, they're down 70% for God's sake. They're improved. That's my point. Things are going to start to improve. We've bottomed, we're now at the bottom, and we're going to be at the bottom for a little while here because the lockdowns haven't really ended. Some states are opening up a little, like where I am in Miami, you can play tennis now. That really doesn't qualify as deep economic stimulus by any stretch of the imagination, but we're getting better. And for certain sectors of the economy, this lockdown has been spectacular. If you sell booths, I tell you, you're living large. Package stores are rocking it. If you sell guns, you're doing spectacularly well. Gun sales, whoosh, way up. I mean, look at that history. This graph I'm showing you 20 years of history. This is the best it's been for gun sales, right? I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. So, you know, some sectors are skyrocketing. And I know in, 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 in Minnesota, it's illegal to consume drugs. So far be it from me to suggest you do something illegal. But in states where it's legal, look what's going on. They're moving like crazy. I guess we're spending too much time with our family. And while we love them very much, we need an escape. So the booze and the marijuana, you know, give us a little bit of a break. You put all this together, this lousy economic data, and you get, you get change in personal consumption expenditure, PCE. This is how big C, the first term in GDP, is doing, essentially. It's a, it's a harbinger. And you can see it's, it's dropping like a friggin' rock. You can look at the Great, the Great Recession in the middle of the graph, essentially where the gray bar is on the left and center, and it fell by 2 or 3%. We've already fallen by now 5 This data came in this morning at half past 80 East Coast time. I raised to put it in the graphs. So you've got super fresh. This data is warm. It's so fresh, right? And you can see it's just horrible. And wait, it's going to get much worse in Q2 because Q2 GDP decline is going to be four or five times or six times as bad as it was in Q1, negative 4.8. We'll have negative 25 or 30 percent in Q2, right? So this number that I'm showing you right here could well be again negative 20 or negative 30 or something. This is unparalleled. So the drop in consumer consumption staggered, but there's been a lot of things to protect this that the wealth and health of households. Government interventions massive on the monetary and fiscal policy scale, which I will get into in some detail in a couple of seconds. Let's quickly now look at the second term in GDP: I, corporate investment in plant and equipment. There is and why is there any? Because first of all, corporations aren't even very good. This is small business. Are they happy? Not so much. 
And this is just March data. Wait till the April data comes. It'll be much worse because April were locked down the whole month and May were locked down most of the month. Okay, by June, things are going to start to turn around. So hopefully April, this data gets worse in April, maybe worse in May, and then we begin to turn around again, right? The one exception to my belief in things, not my belief, my certainty, that things are bottoming out or on the verge of hitting bottom for the first time and skidding around the bottom is energy. Now, Minnesota, last I checked, doesn't really matter because there's no energy in Minnesota. There's a little bit, of course, in western North, North Dakota. There's rocket shit, right? Western North Dakota, eastern Montana. This is somewhat far away. Um, I guess I-94 takes you up there, I suppose. Um, this is not going to improve. These numbers are absolutely horrifically bad. We're running out of inventory in Cushing, Oklahoma. There's inventory elsewhere, but not enough. We're, we're putting oil on at sea and sea development tankers. There's a real lot of problem in energy. So all energy activity is going to drastically reduce. So um, Montana's going to suffer from this. North Dakota's really going to suffer from this. Again, Minnesota doesn't really care. You're not an energy producing state. But if you look at the data here on rigs, you can see the amount of rigs in production drilling holes in the ground. Whoa, we're not, it's going to go like virtually to zero because every barrel they pull out of the ground is worth nothing, just about nothing. So why drill when you're every, if you lose money on every barrel you sell, right? This is the price, spot price. This is the price you, to take physical possession. Just last week, it was negative 12 bucks in Midland, Texas, which is the heart of, of the Permian Basin in Texas, right? So energy is crashing, and it will continue crashing. And there's no re, there's no resolution to this problem. We can't cut production fast enough to get the price up. It'll take at least a good long time, the end of the year, before we begin to get anything resembling relief in oil prices because demand will go up as we travel more by car, by plane, and we have more truck activity. Truck activity is still down 20%. Autos, auto activity is down 40. Jets are down 60 or 70. These will begin to improve, but until they improve and we reduce oil production and increase oil demand, the excess supply is just ready to have that market. Well, that's going to persist. We can see another measure of how the economy is doing here in terms of internal rail traffic. And there's not much going on. You can see here, 2018 was the peak year for intermodal. This means putting things in a corrugated metal container and taking it from a ship, uh, from a truck or a train and putting it on a ship and then at the other end when it went across the ocean, taking it out of the ship and putting it on a truck or a train. Intermodal, two modes, right? And you can see in 19, it's just crashing, crashing down. We're already down 20, 30% and it's going to get worse, right? Because we're not making cars, we're not making airplanes. Factories aren't making much to lay in their real. We can't even get meat made, for God's sake. Like, that's something that Minnesota cares about, right? There's a lot of meat packing out there. The people aren't healthy. If they're not healthy, they're not well. They can't go to work, obviously. Well, that's, that's production, right? This is not necessarily in the intermodal, but you get the point. So factories aren't working. People don't have a lot of confidence in the economy, right? Well, corporate profits are going to be pretty common. You can see here on this graph right here, corporate profits are weak. Not surprising. They're not selling anything. A big overhead and no sales, profits decline. So firms aren't going to invest in plants and equipment. What do you see firms doing? You see firms, big firms, the biggest, the healthiest, the strongest, public firms. They're not taking shares. They're not buying shares. No share buybacks. And they're all suspending dividends like there's no tomorrow. This is not the sign of, oh, let's invest in plants and equipment. There isn't any investment in plants and equipment. That's what makes C, household consumption, even more important. Cor corporate investments in plants and equipment is declining here. So you've got to compensate where you can, and that's going to be in consumption. That's what you can ignore. You can't force current firms to invest in plants and equipment. It's not going to happen. Airplanes are idle. I mean, it's not happening, right? If you look at manufacturing activity, whoa, I've already led up to this point by telling you things are bad. Firms weren't going to invest in plants and equipment. Rail activity is declined. And you can see that this graph here, the precipitous vertical decline in manufacturing activity. And remember, we're not a big manufacturing economy. We don't manufacture. Manufacturing is 10, 12, 12% 12 of GDP, maybe 10% of employment or 9% of employment. We are primarily a service-based economy. Here before, that helped us. Now it hurts us because how do we spend our money? We spend our money going to a Pilates class, going to our psychologist and talking about our problems, and having a hot rock treatment on our back. We're a totally service-based economy. 50% of all spending, household spending, is, 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 is services. 
So when services can be performed, going to a baseball game, going to a hockey game, going to a Gophers game, right? You you got a problem on your hands. So manufacturing before, when it went down, didn't matter so much, but now it matters because it's, it, it's going down along the services, and services are falling even faster. So this number is pretty crummy. And you put this together, what you see here next graph is the decline in factory utilization rates. Firms aren't investing in plant and equipment. Why on earth would they when they have now more capacity than they've had since the Great Depression, since the Great Recession of 2008-9? When fact, utilization rates start bumping up, up, up 78, 79, near 80% like they did here relatively recently, and they did over there relatively recently, that's when investments in plant and equipment starts taking off. Not now when it's falling on your own. Not going to happen. But, but, there's a huge but here. Not only are we beginning to hit bedrock and start bouncing along the bottom for a couple of months, but April is going to be the worst single month period. May will be a little bit better, but still, we'll still be to the GDP, we'll still be behind, but not as planned. There's this. The government has gotten massively involved in this activity very quickly. If we think back to 2008 9, the recession there, it took till late 2008 before the central bank began doing all kinds of things to aid the economy in monetary policy in a really, really big intervention way. They had cut interest rates, yeah, but they need to do more. And the Congress hadn't done anything yet either. And finally, they began to do things, ARRA and TARP and all these sorts of things. In this case, it's a completely different story. Here, what we're seeing is Congress has gotten already passed four bills. The first one was for $8 billion. The second one was for $50 billion. The third one I'm showing you right now on screen was for about $2.2 trillion. And then the PPP money ran out, Paycheck Protection Plan, it's called, ran out. So what did Congress do? They passed a fourth bill, the one I'm showing you on screen right now, for $500 billion more. So Congress has ponied up about $2.7, $2.8 trillion. Now, it's more than that, actually. If we go back one slide and look right here where my, where my cursor is, in this, this spot here, in that $500 billion, there's $454 billion from the central bank. The central bank is going to take that money and lend against it about 10 to 1. So the central bank will lend $4.5 trillion to businesses and governments, bigger governments, city and county governments, junk bonds, corporate bonds, county and city and municipal bonds, $4.5 trillion. And then the 2.7 trillion minus the 500 billion is 2.2 trillion. So 4.5 trillion and 2.2 trillion, you're almost at seven trillion dollars of injection into the economy, lending and money being given away in PPP money and unemployment money and EIP money. You can't have seven trillion dollars coursing through your economy without some bump in economic activity. Now it can't be now because we're locked in our homes. But wait till we get out of our homes. It'll start to happen. Some restaurants are going to disappear. Some dry cleaners are going to disappear. Some branches of banks are going to go away. Some their bankruptcy. It's not going to be the same like it was. I understand that. But there'll generally be a massive recovery in economic activity. That's what we can have between Q3 and Q4. We can see really strong, solid economic growth. Maybe 3 or 4% in Q3, maybe 10% in Q4, maybe it's 7% in both. I don't really know exactly, but you get my point. So these will be a really above trend economic growth. For a very short time, they'll be really above trend growth. So Congress is all in financial. The central bank is all in financial. The Treasury Department, working with the central bank, is all in. Everybody is all chips in on this hand because it's the only hand we get to play. We don't get to play our hand. We don't get to do this again in four months. We have to get this roughly right now. If we do it roughly right now, we'll be okay. We'll get out. And by early 2021, things are booming. Booming, they're good. They're solid. They're back to normal. We're having decent growth. And late 2020 is really good. Assuming COVID doesn't come back. That's, that's a very, very nasty scenario. It could happen. I don't know. It makes me nervous. During Q&A, we can talk about it. So the federal government is massively in. Will this increase our deficit? You better believe it. The deficits can increase anywhere between 16 to 20 percent, depending on how fast the money comes, gets spent, and how much GDP declines too, because it's debt over G deficit over GDP. But if GDP goes down, then the whole fraction goes up, right? So it's complicated a little bit. But between 16 and 20 percent, is it time to worry about this? 
No. Look, when your house is burning down, you pick your hose and you put the water, you put water in your hose and you douse your house fire. You don't say, oh, wow, next month the water bill will be high. It's damn the water bill, save the friggin' house. That's what we're doing now. We're saving the house from burning down. And that's, this is the appropriate response. Moreover, monetary policy is much weaker than it was. Even though the central bank is all in, they're going to lend four and a half trillion dollars. They've lowered rates to zero. They can't lower rates further. Last recession, they could lower rates by five percentage points or 500 basis points. This time, they can't because rates are already at zero because they, were, they began this recession six weeks ago at just one and a half percent because of prior economic activity that was very weak, we couldn't get strong economic growth. Therefore, we already had low interest rates. So barring lack of low interest rates, you have to do more on the fiscal policy side, and Congress is doing it. So Congress gets a good grade for what it's doing. The central bank gets a good grade for what it's doing. The Treasury Department is getting a good grade for what it's doing. I, I, no one's here sitting on their laurels or waste, wasting time. No, they didn't go as fast enough as I wanted. I would like to see them go even weaker or faster. But hey, this is life. That's why we're not going to have a V. Things take longer than we think. Now, in terms of exports, just forget about exports. Trade war with China still continues. The U.S. dollar, as you see here, is remarkably strong. Because why? When the banks are in, what do people do? They move into dollars. That pushes the value of dollar up, right? And the globe is slowing, generally speaking, faster than we are right now. Europe is going is falling faster than we are right now. And Canada and Mexico are both basket cases for differing reasons. But in Canada's case, heavily reliance on energy and energy and mining, they're both doing terribly. And Mexico is being just drastically mismanaged by their incompetent president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador or AMLO. He's just a complete economic buffoon. There are other ones out there, but he's right, he's on our southern border, it matters. So we're not gonna get any export relief exporting to either Canada or Mexico, right? It's not gonna happen. There are countries are worse, and Europe right now is worse too, because COVID hit them before it hit us. So exports aren't going to help at all. So if you put this together, this was sort of the monthly process of GDP decline. GDP decline was up in January here and in February. It collapses in March. It gets worse in April. That's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at April being much worse than March and May being horrible, June being crummy. Less bad progressively in those months, but you get the point. You're going to add it up. You're going to have a really terrible, really terrible. But again, there's a silver lining here. Well, that's a lot of just a good news. The recession will be blessedly very short. It will be short because the decline has been incredibly precipitous. I mean, you know, when you fall straight down, it's much faster than you fall this way. GDP declines in normal recessions goes like this. It takes 12 months, 9 months, 12 months, whatever, right? This one's like this. Well, you hit the bottom, you're done. So you look at this, the, the graphs I'm showing here are all the recessions dating back to just before the Civil War. There aren't many that are really green. I have an arrow under one in particular, above one in particular. It was the recession that followed the, the Spanish influenza virus of 1918. It was that, that corona, that coronavirus, that Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918. It killed seven or 800,000 Americans and 50 million people worldwide, infected 500 million people like a quarter of the planet at the time, was followed by a very, very short and very brief depression with a D. It was so short, seven months, because we banged hit bottom and then began to recover. So when you, when you hit hard and fast, chances are you're going to recover. It's going to be short, deep, but short, and then you begin to recover. Now here, this time, we've also got $7 trillion of monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus into the economy. That cannot but help speed the recovery and reduce the duration of the downside, right? It can't cushion the fall that much, although it's doing that too by giving people money. Unemployment insurance is being aided and amended and so on. So now, how fast the recovery gets? I've told you if you get rid of the V, that's just stupid nonsense, right? Goodbye, V. This TV show is brought to you by the letter U, maybe? Or the, or the word back. Or we sit at the bottom for a while and go back up. I don't think it's going to be that way either. I think it's really going to be a checkbook for the recession. Short, painful decline, deep painful decline, followed by a long and steady road to recovery, such that by the end of 2022, right, it's a long ways away from here, right? We're now the 22 and a half years from now, we're going to 
we're back where we were on February 29th, just before the lockdown orders began going anywhere. Now, the wild card in all this is you. What is your perspective on things? How comfortable are you going to be going out? Tell me when you're going to feel comfortable licking the floor of the men's room. I mean, that's the question you have to ask yourself. It may be a mildly crude, but it's, you know, when are you going to hug your mother? I'm not hugging my mother. She's 83 years old. I'm not hugging my dad. He's 85. I don't want to kill them. Well, you know, they're not going to go out to a restaurant. I can't take them from mother, my mom to Mother's Day for a restaurant. They're closed. I'm not going to take my dad to a restaurant for Father's Day because I'm afraid I'll kill them. But I'm not going to a rock concert as desperately as I want to go to a Guns N' Roses rock concert. I can't because I don't want to die. So when will we feel comfortable? Is this going to be when there's a, a treatment that we know if we get sick, we can get treated? Is it when there's going to be a vaccine that I know I'm going to be immune? I don't know. But these slides I'm putting up here give you some inkling that it isn't going to be overnight. That's why the V is going to turn into a check. This recovery, this part here, has to be much, much slower. I mean, think about it. You can take the keys to your business, close the lights, mail them to the bank, and say, I'm done. But you can't reconstitute your business that fast. It's not open the door, turning on the lights in your business. You got to hire people, get inventory, you know, put ads, marketing, sales, promotions, get in, reestablish relationships with suppliers and vendors and all these things to get your business going. It's a very different world. Here's another slide that asks the same question. How quick will it be before you're comfortable? The numbers don't matter. The part that counts is that the part that's gray basically is no, not really. And you can see it depends what it is, but even at the upper end when it's eat out at a restaurant, a lot of people aren't willing to go there very quickly, right? And if the, even this part here is six months from now. That's why there's no B, there's this. Not a U. The U would suggest no one's doing anything for a while. I don't see that or that. No. I see the recovery occurring just much more slowly than the decline. So this is what's going to happen. It'll take us three years to get there, four years for job growth to return to where it was. Now let's talk about labor markets. Labor markets were incredibly tight going into this recession. They were crazy tight. They were super tight. Now they're not so tight because we've lost a lot of jobs. You look at the next graph, this is first time claims for people who've lost their job. You can see it spikes out at almost 7 million. This data came out this morning again at half past eight. It falls to 6.6 .6 million, and it falls to 5 point something. It fell to 4.3 or something and just this morning. They tell us that last week it fell to 3.8. We're getting better. We're not going to keep losing 6, 7 million jobs a week. That said, we've already lost 30 million jobs. It's almost a quarter of our labor force. Going into this, our labor force was 160. We've already lost 30. We'll probably lose four or five. We'll get to 35 million, 36 million. This is really amazing. It's almost a quarter of our labor force. And we already had five and a half million people not working before the recession began. Unemployment was low at three and a half percent. If you add those five and a half million, we're already at about 40 million. So we may well have 25% of unemployment rates. The last time we had that was the depression. This is an economic calamity. I, I cannot sugarcoat this in any shape or form. But we are going to end it blessedly fast and we'll begin to recover. How fast we recover depends to a large extent on healthcare, depends on treatment availability, depends on the vaccine. Depends on how you and I interact and how willing we are to go out and spend money and party. It, it, it depends on if coronavirus comes back in late November, when the flu, regular flu season starts, it now becomes part of the general all around flu. These are all unknowns. We don't have answers to these things, but we will recover. And the recovery starts probably no later than July. In Q3, maybe we're lucky it starts in June. We really begin to get some economic in June. Now, how about inflation? No inflation. There is isn't inflation. This is today's data. Again, a couple of slides I added this morning. What does this show us? It shows us there's no inflation. Blue is headline inflation, which includes food and energy. And energy prices, as we discussed, have collapsed. That's why the blue line shows this precipitous decline at the very far right graph. 
By contrast, red, which is much more smooth, excludes food and energy. It's core inflation, or not if you will, it's core inflation. It's also moving down a little bit late like, because energy is cheaper. So the cost of buying gasoline, you know, things that have gas in them, shingles for your roof, transportation to move a package, and so on is cheaper, bringing things down. And next month, it isn't going to change a lot. It'll be cheaper as well. As well. And restaurants are cheaper. Airline tickets are really cheap, right? There's all kinds of deflation going on, pushing down on inflation. So inflation is not a concern. This is important for a couple of reasons. One, things aren't going to cost much more money. Two, interest rates can stay low for a long time. Because what drives interest rates is inflation and inflation expectations, really, and GDP growth. Well, GDP growth ain't going to be that hot. We may have a quarter or two that's really good. But basically, we're going to go back to 2 or 2.5%, 4% GDP growth, and there's no inflation. So a central bank doesn't have to raise rates pretty much ever. So what's going to happen to interest rates? I'm glad you asked. Let's have a quick look. First, let's review monetary policy in the U.S. for the last 45 years, 43. Paul Volcker comes into the central bank in 1979. He's on the far left of the graph. He's very, very he was six foot eight, or as he would say, I'm only five foot 20. Um, he was tall, interest rates were really high. And then he gets replaced by Alan Greenspan, who's shorter. And what happens? Rates fall. And then he's replaced by Ben Bernanke. And what happens? Rates fall. And then comes Janet Yellen. And what happens? Rates fall more. People are shorter, and interest rates go down. If Trump wanted to have lower rates to begin with, he should never have hired Powell. Powell was simply too tall. He should have hired a good, solid monetary economist who's five feet or shorter, and he would have had terrific success. He hired Powell. Powell believed he was the right person for the job. He knew he was tall. He raised interest rates too much. He gave back some of the rate increase in 2019, and then when 2020 came, rates were only 1.5%. He dropped them to zero. It's just three or four weeks. He dropped them. Take two weeks. Them by 50 basis points or 100 basis points to 50 or whatever it was. He dropped them super fast because that was the appropriate monetary response to the crisis that we're in. So, what happens to interest rates? Well, right now, rates are at an eighth of like they're between zero and a quarter, and they bounce around a bit there. What do I think happens? Look, I don't really know, but I'll tell you this. This is my most optimistic scenario. This is the scenario where the Fed raises rates really fast. And you can see in this example that I put out, not example, my, my true belief that the central bank raises rates by half a percentage point, half a percentage point in the next almost three years. By the end of 2022, Fed funds rates between half and three quarters of a point. It's five eighths of a point. It's going positively nowhere. And this may be much too optimistic. I mean, yesterday Powell spoke about not raising rates at all. But you never know, things might get better, inflation takes off, and the GDP grows a little faster than we think. He has to make a nominal increase in rates just to show markets that he's paying attention. And as I mentioned earlier, the central bank has not only lowered rates, they're also created all these lending facilities here that I'm showing you here in blue. They're opening up all these facilities to lend against. And if you, put, you add all this money up together, you got trillions and trillions of dollars. Congress with 2.2 trillion, the central bank with 4.2 trillion. $7 trillion dollars around here. It's a lot of money. It prevents the worst from happening. It speeds the rate of recovery. It ensures we don't go into a depression, a great depression that has any lasting duration beyond three to four months. Now, let's focus on housing. That's what we really all care about. This is all background information, background music. Important. The background. Be careful with housing. In the short run, we're going to suffer. There's no doubt. We've already seen automobile sales, which are related to home sales. They're not the same. It's easy to get a car loan. It's not so easy to get an auto loan. You do a home loan once or twice in your life, maybe three times. You, you buy a car a lot. People are familiar with cars. They're not with housing. There's no public guarantor like Fannie and Freddie and FHA and VA and, 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 and Ginny and all these institutions helping you with auto loans. There's differences. First, let's look at sentiment. Sentiment is not good. This is, this is data collected by Gallup between April 1st and April 15th. So it's a little bit dated already. It's two weeks old, which in this world is like forever, right? 
these COVID years are like dog years, six pieces in the year. Maybe it's gotten a little worse or a little better, but it's going to be rough to get out there. You can see this data goes back to 1978 when this poll question first came out. It's not all that hot. It's actually the lowest it's been. You can see it went up steadily, got steadily. There were there was only several polls taken at this point. There wasn't an annual weekly election data poll. It was pretty high in 2002. Homes were still cheap, the economy was still good. And then as home prices began to get more and more expensive, consumer sentiment declined. Then the recession kicks in. Then the recession kicks in and stays low. Then house prices get really cheap out of the recession and begin to improve. And they roughly are flat for a year, between 2006 or 2008, whatever it is, in 2014 or 15, it's essentially going nowhere, from 71 to 69. Meaningless move. And then, of course, Home prices start to get expensive again. Rates are going up. Home prices are going up and sentiment declines. And then, of course, comes coronavirus. So we had just, be just before the coronavirus, we had very high house prices, low interest rates, very high home prices. And it was still doing okay. And then this, the thing that hits the next master. What does this mean for sales activity and quality? The news here is pretty good. This is data that came out yesterday from the Mortgage Bankers Association. What it shows us is that year-over-year, first-time mortgage apps are down 20% year-over-year. And you go, whoa, 20%, not so good. And I go, yeah, that's true, but a couple weeks ago, it was down negative 35. So again, we thumped the bottom at negative 35, and now we're going back up here. How fast we go up and where we end up, I don't really know. But we know that the bottom was already reached somewhere in early to mid-April. In the last couple of weeks of April, we've seen solid improvement from negative 35 to negative 31 to negative 1. Right? So if you think like late March, early April is the world of real estate, don't. That's a mistake. Things are better. Now, if you take this same graph, this graph shows us, you know, 2000, you know, 1999, the far left. Then 2000, 2001, 2000, you add each year progressively to this snake line. Instead, layer one year on top of the other, you get the following graph. And this graph shows us we, we trotted out several, several weeks ago, and now we're on the improvement. This only shows us the negative 31. We're now at negative 20. So we're probably up here somewhere where my, where my, where my cursor is, right? We're up here somewhere. We're much better than we were there. That was the bottom. And you can see we, hit, we fell fast. We kind of leveled out, and now we're improving. So real estate's going to get better because the economy's going to get better because people aren't going to lose their homes because everyone's unemployed is going to get good unemployment insurance, and the PPPs out there, and the EIDL loans are out there, and the airlines are getting saved, and people are getting forbearance, and all those kinds of things are going to prevent the house of cards, no pun intended, from, from collapsing on us like it did in 2008. There are a lot of differences between this recession and the recession of 08. There's a world of difference. They're both recessions. This one's very short and very deep. That one was much longer and not nearly as deep, but relatively deep. Look, look, let's dig deeper in the housing activity. Let's look at existing sales. Existing sales are down 8%. They fell 8% last month in March. They'll get worse in April because only in April do we begin to hit bedrock because I've been talking about bouncing around the bottom. So April sales will be worse than March sales. They'll probably fall another 15, 10, 15%. That wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. So we end up falling, you know, from the mid fives down to the upper of the mid fours. You fall overall 20, 23, 24%. But then things begin to get better. Why do they get better? Why is this time different than last time? This time is different than last time because the housing market's in a completely different place than it was last year. This is last time. Sales were unbelievably good because anybody could get a loan. My daughter was nine, and she used to get three or four credit card offers a week. She'd get those credit cards, get that money, make it down payment for the house. She was nine. We didn't even have a dog. But had we had a dog, I'm sure the dog would have gotten credit card offers. There were option-only arms. There were liar. There were liar loans. There were there were option-only no dog liar loans. There were ninja loans. No income, no job, no problem. Right. It was whatever you want. You fogged the mirror, you got a loan. Securitizers were securitizing everything. Home builders were building everything. The mortgage insurance companies were insuring everything. It was all garbage, right? But not now. Right now, the housing market hit its peak just in late December, late in 2019, late and early 20. It was a gangbuster level. It was the best it had been. Things were super. 
job growth was good, rates were super low, prices were high, and home buyer sentiment, as we looked at earlier, wasn't so hot, but things were going pretty well. Compare it back now, and this was the peak. Remember the peak number here of 7 million that I'm showing you. Now, look at the next slide. Look at the inventory levels back in 2008. They were crazy high. Because the builders were building their brains out for nobody. There were no one, there were no home buyers buying those homes. They were all being built, built for flippers. So we had a massive oversupply of housing. The builders were building like crazy. Inventory was way too high. Anybody could get a loan, and then it all stopped. Everything stopped. Buying stopped, loan stopped. And we had this huge overhang of inventory, which caused what? House prices to collapse. Everyone lost their home, foreclosure skyrocketed, and we were off to the proverbial races. Now, look at inventory now, the very far right of the graph. Stupendously low. Inventories are hitting lows every single month. So looking at the history of January's going back to the 1983 or 84 and our And I'm looking at all of February's, all of March's, and so on. Every month now sets a record pretty much. And if they're not a record, it's the lowest it's been since on the far left of the graph, 1999. Right? We're getting 20 year, 30 year lows every single month now. There's no part because people don't know where they sell the house part and they buy a new one. It's a problem. And the builders aren't building anything. If you look at the boom last time, builders were right here at the right center of the graph. At the peak, at the peak time, they were building 2.3 million homes a month annualized basis. What were these idiots thinking? They clearly had no brain. They left their brain at the job site clearly or at home or something. They were overbuilding NASA, and that's why the existing inventory of homes began to skyrocket. Credit was available to the builders, so they built. Now, there was nothing going on. There was a blip at the end of December, of December 19 and January that 20. They went way up because weather was really warm. So they, began, they were pulling many more permits compared to the prior year, so it was a huge problem. And then, of course, Corona comes and crashes in. If you ignore those last three months, builders were building at 1.2, 1.3 million homes. Barely half as much as they were building 12 years ago. Credit, harder to get. Dodd Frank comes in, uh, you know, uh, qualified mortgages, QM mortgage, qualified mortgages have become really important and so on, right? It ain't easy, so it's easy to get a mortgage like it used to be. Hard to get a mortgage, more down payments, builders aren't building, inventory short, buyers want to buy, there's a massive shortage of housing, prices are going up, and now all the saving graces of the recession. Unemployment insurance was bumped up by 2,400 a month for three months, so people can afford to pay their rent or a mortgage on a house, a small mortgage anyways. Uh, Fannie and Freddie, yeah, if you have a mortgage, you can go into forbearance. If you feel like you don't even have to prove you need forbearance, you can get forbearance. It's a problem. That's creating other problems. In Q&A, we can talk about that. But that's helping people. Renters are not going to be kicked out of their homes either. So we're keeping people in their home. We're giving people money to, to survive and pay their bills. The builders weren't building. The inventory was tight. Sales were weak on existing homes only because there was nothing to buy. So don't think that this recession is going to look like the last recession for homes. Homes are just a collateral damage now, like everything. Like automobiles are collateral damage, and escrow are collateral damage. You're in it. We're in it. The soup together with everybody else. We're not special. This is not the housing cost. This is the great lockdown, which is causing housing for those in garbage can, but only for a brief period of time. Deeply, they're down 30, 35%. Look at new home sales, they're well down too. On the very far right, you can see it. They fell by 15%. So existing sales in March fell by eight, but new home sales in March fell by 15. New home sales are the better indicator, of course, because new home sales in March are contract signed in March, right? Sales in March for existing homes were contract signed in January and February when things were fine and no one could see COVID-19 coming. So these March data are really just a harbinger of something that was beginning to go bad a couple months ago. The March data for existing, for new homes, is telling us you're in the corona, right? You're already in the corona. It isn't that deep, but you're already in the corona. So April existing homes, new home sales will really plummet. Existing sales will fall less, but they will fall as well. We saw that in the first time mortgage acts that, that, that dropped out of negative 35 and they began to improve April and on. So wait till May, you can actually show homes. Now, you're all doing it, technologically innovative things and, and virtual showing and 60 tours and documents, you know, meeting, you can close without meeting and all kinds of stuff like that. 
work on your technology, make sure you're at the top of your tech game, really important. In terms of builders, they're freaking miserable because they're not going to be building anything, right? Sentiment's gone to hell, no one's looking at a house because they can't leave their own house. They should be looking at virtual houses, the builders are remiss for not upping their technological game, but that's their problem. And I guess yours eventually, hopefully they do. And again, look at the new inventory. If you go back to the Great Recession, you can see a massive amount of inventory. So there was a massive amount of existing homes and new homes the builders were building, the sellers were selling, the securitizers were securitizing, the lenders were loaning. Now, not so much. Builders don't have a lot of excess homes. Green is homes that are permanent but not started. Blue is being built, spec homes being built, or homes being built. And red is built but not sold. You can see here where my cursor is, that's a disaster area. A built home having to service the cost of a home is being built. Not, look at it now. It's super low. The builders are very responsible now. They have made no really critical, thoughtless decisions. They're much more professional than they were. The bad guys are gone now. Because of this, I don't see prices at the time. Volume will go well down 20, 30, 40%. Much, and then we get into that. The prices don't fall much because the recovery is pretty solid. We know that in three months the economy begins to improve, or two months the economy begins to improve. Most sellers aren't that desperate to sell a house. They can't wait a month or two. You know, to pick up 30, 40,000 bucks, they'll pay three or 4,000 to borrow, they'll wait, they'll change their selling decision, they'll, they'll wait to move out of an extra month. They're always desperate, motivated sellers a little bit, but not fast enough. And there's not all this foreclosure activity going on at the same time, exacerbating the problem. Well, to close off, I want to show you a couple of slides here and look at what architectural institutions are thinking they're depressed. So they've taken all their employees and they fired them all. And in three or four months, they'll begin to break back slowly. I'm not sure how fast, but they'll start bringing them back because they'll start getting work again. Not a tremendous amount of work, but they'll get work again. Now, last but not least, what's going on here? I want to leave you with the breath of fresh air. Don't get happy. This is inappropriate. Don't close. Don't. Because next month, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin will all be in garbage cans. You just got there the next one month. Not quite sure why, but you have one more month in March. The whole upper Northwest, mid Midwest, the Northwest, was all surprisingly strong in March relative to the decay going on elsewhere. But come April, this graph. Just as dark and miserable in the upper left hand corner the middle as it is everywhere else. I hope I've given you some food for thought, something to talk to, to prospective buyers and sellers about in terms of the condition of the housing market, in terms of interest rates, in terms of the difference this time from last recession with this regarding housing, and the overall shape of the national economy, what the recovery shape looks like, check mark, how long it takes to get us back to where we were almost three years, and how long it takes labor to come back closer. Or if you want to get a hold of me, this is how to do it. This is my phone number, email, Twitter handle, cell phone number. And I put out every day 70 words on the economy. No graphs, no ads, no charts, no links, and no photos. If you want to receive my daily stuff, it's free. You can go to my website, econ70, and sign up. Or, 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 imagine this. Wait for it. You can wait, text, wait for it. Bow tie. Six letters, not bow and tie, no hyphen, just six letters together. No hyphen, no space to the five digit number 22828. Again, 22828. You'll be prompted for an email address. You'll hear from me every day till you die. And when you die, you're hell. But you'll see me there. I'll keep sending you these daily economic updates all the time. There's time for questions. I'll take a bunch of questions. I spoke a little bit longer than I planned. I'm make sure to make it up for it in QA time. So shoot your questions out. Sign up for my blog. I hope I've given you some reasons to understand what's going on. Be aware of the severity of the we're experiencing right now, but also be fully aware that the end is relatively near. And the Q3 and Q4 are already going to be pretty decent quarters, and we're going to get out of this alive. We're going to be okay. Just grin and bear it for the next month or two. We've already gone through half, at least half, close to the end. Thank you so much, Elliot. Um, for questions, you can raise your hand. I know we have a couple of them, a couple of them in the chat um, here, but you can raise your hand, and then I can allow you to uh, speak and ask your question if you want to do that. 
Otherwise, if you do want to type it in the chat, that is totally fine. Uh, Terry Sullivan, uh, Sullivan asks, um, second surge concerns. Yeah. Next question. So second surge concerns are a real problem. There's two different things going on. One is we open up too early and we circulate amongst each other and start hugging and kissing each other, and that causes the outbreak. The other concern, and I think we have no choice there. We cannot... The epidemiologist in me wants to lock us down for six more months. The economist in me says we can't afford it. We just don't have it. The fact that we weren't ready for this pandemic when it came and we frittered away months of time doing stupid things and now we now find ourselves where we are. We've done terrific stimulus and monetary policy stimulus, but we have to open the doors and let ourselves out and just hope we keep social distancing and don't do stupid things. Now, we also have the problem in the late fall of the virus returning. Hopefully by then we have a, a treatment, ample PPP, hospital rooms that are ready to go, lots of, plenty of ventilators, God forbid, if we need them. And we can physically move sick patients. If you get sick in Minneapolis, you don't have to stay in Minneapolis, good Lord. You can ship them off to Fargo or something. I mean, I don't mean to be silly, but we have to figure out ways to expand our hospital capabilities. As long as hospitals in total aren't overwhelmed, we can keep getting six people want to have that but that's remember the, the whole reason of locking this down was to, to flatten the curve it wasn't necessarily to save lives although i'd like to save lives too don't get me wrong i'm not an ogre who wants to see people die god forbid but we have to open up we have to take the risk that in the next couple months we get more hot spots and we just have to be quicker and sharp, sharper about how we treat them and how we do lockdowns in small areas or something um but the return is is, is a real fear it comes back hard in December like they expected to, that may require locking us down again for a month or something, or locking us down in parts of the country. That said, we'll be better at it. We'll know what social distancing is. We'll know that people are going to die if we don't do it. It's a bad thought. It's a distinct possibility. Beyond that, what can we do? Does my modeling assume it? The answer is no. Uh, next question, uh, what is going to happen to Minnesota and why is it green? Yeah, Minnesota, was, the, the data there was, it could have been that, I, I don't know the answer. I, I could look and let you know later. But the data there on that graph, a couple graphs back, the map, was based on four things, retail sales, unemployment rates, housing starts, and something else I can't remember. It could have been that housing starts in Minneapolis, in the state, was ju were just really good because the weather was good. I don't know that for a fact. I'm not saying that. But one of those four variables or two of them happened to be particularly good in March. It's meaningless. I just wanted to leave you on a mildly happy note. Do not take from that that Minnesota and the Dakotas are special. On the contrary, North Dakota is going to go into the trash can come April because their energy sector is going to die completely. So Williston and Dickinson are going to fall off the freaking planet. It's just that housing starts may have been good because the weather was relatively warm and they could build, they could do more starts. And that pushed up numbers, just an artifact of weird weather and some good luck and some funny timing. Awesome. And then um, thoughts on universal basic income is, yeah. and then follow up to that, is the uh, 1,200 person stimulus check enough? And is there anything else you'd like to see from the government? Well, let's take those one at a time. UBI was the first question, right? Universal basic income. I'm a big right. opponent of it. I am dead set against it. I think paying people not to work is just a really bad idea. I would like, however, we do have to do a rethink. And I think this, this virus thing has caused us to suddenly think and say, whoa, teachers, Hey, they do a yeoman service. My kid may be illiterate, but thank God the kid's in school all day. Because, you know, I'm, I, I'm now teaching my kid at home. I'm not literally. My kid's almost finished college. But you get my point. I'd be banging down gin and tonics at 9 o'clock in the morning, and I'd be teaching stone drunk. We need people to drive trucks to bring food around to us. They're really important. All these jobs that we've sort of poo-pooed before, suddenly the guy who delivers food to our door, Wow, this guy may be saving my life and putting his life at risk. Suddenly, we realize these people who we may have looked down upon before, we shouldn't, and we should pay them more money. Look, I'm a conservative guy, right? But this is a way for us to rethink and say, how do we make work valuable? How do we make work appealing? How do we tell people 
we want you to work. And if you do your end of the deal, work, we'll make sure to give you a survivable wage. And there are different ways to do it. We can do an earned income tax credit. We can incentivize the employer. We can incentivize the employee with minimum wage. We could do a combination of these things. Some I like more than others. I'm not a big fan of raising the minimum wage that much. But we have to figure out a way to pay people more money. And this should show us that these people that are critical to our lives, we, I can stay home and make a living doing this, but these people can't. And we need them to survive to have our economy. So paying them a couple bucks extra more is important. That's a better way to do it. Give them dignity. Tell them that we have a compact that you work, we, we value your work and we'll protect you as, as a citizen with, 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 with decent, to pay enough to survive, right? Second question. I don't remember what it was. Stimulus uh, checks? Second question is about the uh, stimulus checks and if that 1200 is enough. Okay, I think the 1200 was a mistake. I think it, it, wasn't, it wasn't enough, but it was a mistake. So everyone doesn't need 1200 bucks. I mean, it limited out as you got to 75,000 for a single person up to 100, it shrank and by above 100, it's gone. So it was means tested to some extent, good. But everybody doesn't need the money. Give the money to where, where it's needed most. Could they have thought this through better on the unemployment side? I think they could have here. Maybe not, they had to get the money out really, really fast. I would have preferred to see them offer people unemployment insurance, not so much that extra 600 a week before for through July 31st, I think it's going to hurt labor markets because more people are going to make more money on UI than actually working, which is not good. But they could have extended it longer, a little bit less money per, per week, maybe 200 a week, not 400 a week, um, 600 a week, I'm sorry, only 200 a week, not 600 a week, but do it for more months. So if you couldn't find a job that fast, you'd be protected. I would have preferred to see that. But I think they're going to have to do more stimulus now. I don't think you've done enough. I think we have to come back and come back and do more. Either help governments, because if governments don't get help, they're going to have to fire lots of workers. That's going to be a problem, too. So it was a little misplaced. But again, in the heat of battle, the fog of war, it was pretty good. I give it a B plus at worst, which is for Congress, like an exceptionally good grade. Uh, and a follow up to that question that kind of leads into it. Is there anything else you'd like to see from the government? Wow, I... I'd like to see them get enough PPE, personal protective equipment. I'd like to see them see us get ventilators where they're needed. I'd like to see a more unified message. I really would. It's up to each governor to do what they want. That's the U.S. federal system, obviously. I'd like us to be prepared for the fall coronavirus attack if it comes. Hopefully it doesn't come. Maybe it's weaker and not stronger. People expect it to be stronger. I, I'd like to think that we'll be ready for that. That's six months away, for God's sake. That shouldn't be a big stretch for a country as rich and as developed and as diversified as we are. We should be able to be ready for that with gangbusters and a decent treatment. And we should be close, hopefully, to begin testing with a vaccine. Awesome. Uh, is there any other questions? Um, at the bottom of your screen, you can raise your hand, type it in the chat, and there's also the Q&A button as well. Well, I guess we've done a perfect job collecting. Uh, we got one person here. Uh, let's see. You are unmuted. Go ahead. Will this video be available again to watch another time? Um. Was it, was it recorded? Yes, uh, we do have it recorded. And um, so I'll be going through the footage and kind of editing down the beginning portion of it and getting it up. Um, I did see your email to Kristen. She uh, forwarded it to me. Um, but yes, it will be available um, to rewatch. Perfect. The only caveat here is uh, I'm only going to give you permission to keep it up for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I do that not because I don't want you to see it. I just don't want you to see old information. Things move at light speed of late. So my opinions and attitudes and thinking about the economy change over time, obviously, always, but now more so because there's so much external stimulus coming and going. I don't want you to base your decisions on old information. But totally yeah, understand. By all means, <laughs> encourage Thank your you. friends to go look at it. I want you to see it. Just two weeks, please take it down. And send me a link if you would too. Oh, absolutely. Yep, um, it'll go up on our YouTube and then um, get distributed on our social platforms. But yeah, I'll definitely make sure I can get that to you as well. Uh, are there any other questions?
Well, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Thank you all. Thank you all really very much for the invitation. I hope and pray that the next time I see you, it's in person and not through this Zoom box. (laughs) It has to be in the Zoom box fashion. We'll do it again and whenever it is. But again, hopefully I get to see you in person in St. Paul at the convention center or somewhere fun like that. And uh, I wish you all Godspeed and stay healthy and uh, be well. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you so much much for having us or for being here with us. My pleasure. Thank you all, Jennifer and Danielle. Thank Thank you. you.